Chapter 1 of Book 7 of Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 7, Slang. Chapter 1, Origin. Pigrita is a terrible word. It engenders a whole world. La pègre, for which red theft, and a hell la pegren for which red hunger thus idleness is the mother she has a son theft and a daughter hunger where are we at this moment in the land of slang what is slang it is at one and the same time a nation and a dialect it is theft in its two kinds people and language when for in thirty years ago the narrator of this grave and sombre history introduced into a work written with the same aim as this a thief who talked argo there arose amazement and clamour what how argo why argo is horrible it is the language of prisons galleys convicts of everything that is most abominable in society etc etc we have never understood this sort of objections. Since that time, two powerful romancers, one of whom is a profound observer of the human heart, the other an intrepid friend of the people, Balzac and Eugene Sue, having represented their ruffians as talking their natural language, as the author of The Last Day of a Condemned Man did in 1828, the same objections have been raised. People repeated, What do authors mean by that revolting dialect? Slang is odious. Slang makes one shudder. Who denies that? Of course it does. When it is a question of probing a wound, a gulf, a society, since when has it been considered wrong to go too far, to go to the bottom? We have always thought that it was sometimes a courageous act, and, at least, a simple and useful deed, worthy of the sympathetic attention which duty accepted and fulfilled merits. Why should one not explore everything and study everything? Why should one halt on the way? The halt is a matter depending on the sounding line and not on the leads man. Certainly, too, it is neither an attractive nor an easy task to undertake an investigation into the lowest depths of the social order, where terra firma comes to an end and where mud begins, to rummage in those vague murky waves, to follow up, to seize and to, to fling, still quivering upon the pavement that abject dialect which is dripping with filth when thus brought to the light, that pustulous vocabulary, each word of which seems an unclean ring from a monster of the mire and the shadows. Nothing is more lugubrious than the contemplation thus in its nudity, in the broad light of thought, of the horrible swarming of slang. It seems, in fact, to be a sort of horrible beast made for the night, which has just been torn from its cesspool. One thinks one beholds a frightful, living, and bristling thicket which quivers, rustles, wavers, returns to shadow, threatens, and glares. One word resembles a claw, another an extinguished and bleeding eye. Such and such a phrase seems to move like the claw of a crab. All this is alive with the hideous vitality of things which have been organized out of organization. Now, when has horror ever excluded study? Since when has malady banished medicine? Can one imagine a naturalist refusing to study the viper, the bat, the scorpion, the centipede, the tarantula, and one who would cast them back into their darkness, saying, Oh, how ugly that is! 
The thinker who should turn aside from slang would resemble a surgeon who would avert his face from an ulcer or a wart. He would be like a philologist refusing to examine a fact in language, a philosopher hesitating to scrutinize a fact in humanity. For it must be stated to those who are ignorant of the case that Argot is both a literary phenomenon and a social result. What is slang, properly speaking? It is the language of wretchedness. We may be stopped, the fact may be put to us in general terms, which is one way of attenuating it. We may be told that all trades, professions, it may be added, all the accidents of the social hierarchy and all forms of intelligence have their own slang. The merchant who says, Montpellier not active, Marseille fine quality. The broker on change who says, assets at end of current month. The gambler who says, tiers et tout, refait de pique. The sheriff of the Norman Isles who says, the holder in fee reverting to his landed estate cannot claim the fruits of that estate during the hereditary seizure of the real estate by the Morgagor. The playwright who says, the piece was hissed. The comedian who says, I've made a hit. The philosopher who says, phenomenal triplicity. The huntsman who says, Voilici allez, voilici fouillon. The phrenologist who says, amativeness, combativeness, secretiveness. The infantry soldier who says, my shooting iron. The cavalry man who says, my turkey cock. The fencing master who says, tears, cart, break. The printer who says, my shooting stick and galley. All printer, fencing master, cavalry, dragoon, infantry man, phrenologist, huntsman, philosopher, comedian, playwright, sheriff, gambler, stockbroker, and merchant speak slang. The painter who says, my grinder, the notary who says, my skip the gutter, the hairdresser who says, my mealy back, the cobbler who says, my cub, talks slang. Strictly speaking, if one absolutely insists on the point, all the different fashions of saying the right and the left, the sailor's port and starboard, the scene shifter's court side and garden side, the beetle's gospel side and epistle slide, are slang. There is the slang of the affected lady as well as of the precieuses. The Hotel Rambouillet near, nearly adjoins the Cour de Miracle. There is a slang of duchesses. Witness this phrase contained in a love letter from a very great lady and a very pretty woman of the Restoration. You will find in this gossip a fultitude of reasons why I should libertize. Diplomatic ciphers are slang. The pontifical chancellery by using 26 for Rome, gerzicten dissolve for dispatch, and abfuxtugurzu to xi for the du de Modena speaks slang. The physicians of the Middle Ages who, for carrot, radish, and turnip, said opopinac perfrosinum reptitalmus dracatholicum angolorum postmagorum, talked slang. The sugar manufacturer who says loaf, clarified, lumps, bastard, common, burnt, this honest manufacturer talks slang. A certain school of criticism twenty years ago, which used to say, half of the works of Shakespeare consists of plays upon words and puns, talked slang. The poet, 
and the artist who, with profound understanding, would designate M. de Montmorency as a bourgeois if he were not a judge of verses and statutes, speaks slang. The classic academician who calls flowers flora, fruits pomona, the sea Neptune, love fires, beauty charms, a horse a courser, the white or tricolored cockade the rose of Bellona, the three-cornered hat Mars's triangle, that classical academician talks slang. Algebra, medicine, botany have each their slang. The tongue which is employed on board ship, that wonderful language of the sea, which is so complete and so picturesque, which was spoken by Jean Bart, de Quesny, Souffrin, and Duper, which mingles with the whistling of the rigging, the sound of the speaking trumpets, the shock of the boarding irons, the roll of the sea, the wind, the gale, the cannon, is wholly a heroic and dazzling slang, which is to the fierce slang of the thieves what the lion is to the jackal. No doubt, but say what we will, this manner of understanding, the word slang, is an extension which every one will not admit. For our part, we reserve to the word its ancient and precise circumscribed and determined significance, and we restrict slang to slang. The veritable slang, and the slang that is preeminently slang, if the two words can be coupled thus, the slang immemorial which was a kingdom, is nothing else, we repeat, than the homely, uneasy, crafty, treacherous, venomous, cruel, equivocal, vile, profound, fatal tongue of wretchedness. There exists, at the extremity of all abasement and all misfortunes, a last misery which revolts and makes up its mind to enter into conflict with the whole mass of fortunate facts and reigning rights. A fearful conflict where now cunning, now violent, unhealthy and ferocious at one and the same time, it attacks the social order with pinpricks through vice, and with club blows through crime. To meet the needs of this conflict, wretchedness has invented a language of combat, which is slang. To keep afloat, and to rescue from oblivion, to hold above the gulf, were it but a fragment of some language which man has spoken and which would otherwise be lost, that is to say, one of the elements, good or bad, of which civilization is composed, or by which it is complicated to extend the records of social observation, is to serve civilization itself. This service Plautus rendered, consciously or unconsciously, by making two Carthaginian soldiers talk Phoenician. That service Moliere rendered by making so many of his characters talk Levantine and all sorts of dialects. Here objections spring up afresh. Phoenician, very good. Levantine, quite right. Even dialect, let that pass. They are tongues which have belonged to nations or provinces, but slang. What is the use of preserving slang? What is the good of assisting slang to survive? To this we reply in one word only, assuredly. If the tongue which a nation or a province has spoken is worthy of interest, the language which has been spoken by a misery is still more worthy of attention and study. It is the language which has been spoken in France, for example, for more than four centuries, not only by a misery, but by every possible human misery. And then we insist upon it 
the study of social deformities and infirmities, and the task of pointing them out with a view to remedy, is not a business in which choice is permitted. The historian of manners and ideas has no less austere a mission than the historian of events. The latter has a surface of civilization, the conflicts of crowns, the births of princes, the marriages of kings, battles, assemblages, great public men, revolutions in the daylight, everything on the exterior. The other historian has the interior, the depths, the people who toil, suffer, wait, the oppressed woman, the agonizing child, the secret war between man and man, obscure ferocities, prejudices, plotted iniquities, the subterranean, the indistinct tremors of multitudes, the die of hunger, the counterblows of the law, the secret evolution of souls, the go bare foot, the bare armed, the disinherited, the orphans, the unhappy, and the infamous, all the forms which roam through the darkness. He must descend with his heart full of charity and severity at the same time, as a brother and as a judge, to those impenetrable casemates, where crawl pell-mell those who bleed and those who deal the blow, those who weep and those who curse, those who fast and those who devour, those who endure evil and those who inflict it. Have these historians of hearts and souls duties at all inferior to the historians of external facts? Does any one think that Alighieri has any fewer things to say than Machiavelli? Is the underside of civilization any less important than the upper side, merely because it is deeper and more sombre? Do we really know the mountain well when we are not acquainted with the cavern? Let us say, moreover, parenthetically, that from a few words of what precedes a marked separation might be inferred between the two classes of historians, which does not exist in our mind. No one is a good historian of the patent, visible, striking, and public life of peoples, if he is not, at the same time, in a certain measure, the historian of their deep and hidden life, and no one is a good historian of the interior, unless he understands at need to be the historian of the exterior also. The history of manners and ideas permeates the history of events, and this is true reciprocally. They constitute two different orders of facts which correspond to each other, which are always interlaced, and which often bring forth results. All the liniments which providence traces on the surface of a nation have their parallels, somber but distinct in their depths, and all convulsions of the depths produce ebullitions on the surface. True history being a mixture of all things, the true historian mingles in everything. Man is not a circle with a single center, he is an ellipse with a double focus. Facts form one of these, and ideas the other. Slang is nothing but a dressing room where the tongue, having some bad action to perform, disguises itself. There it clothes itself in word masks, in metaphor rags. In this guise it becomes horrible. One finds it difficult to recognize. Is it really the French tongue, the great human tongue? Behold it ready to step upon the stage, and to retort upon crime, and prepared for all the employments of the repertory of evil. It no longer walks, it hobbles, it limps on the crutch of the court of miracles, a crutch metamorphosable into a club. It is called vagrancy, Every sort of spectre, its dressers, have painted its face. 
It crawls and rears the double gait of the reptile. Henceforth, it is apt at all rules, and is made suspicious by the counterfeiter, covered with verdigris by the forger, blacked by the soot of the incendiary, and the murderer applies its rouge. When one listens by the side of honest men at the portals of society, one overhears the dialogues of those who are on the outside. One distinguishes questions and replies. One perceives, without understanding it, a hideous murmur, sounding almost like human accents, but more nearly resembling a howl than an articulate word. It is slang. The words are misshapen and stamped with an indescribable and fantastic bestiality. One thinks one hears hydras talking. It is unintelligible in the dark. It gnashes and whispers, completing the gloom with mystery. It is black in misfortune. It is blacker still in crime. These two blacknesses, amalgamated, compose slang. Obscurity in the atmosphere, obscurity in acts, obscurity in voices, terrible toad-like tongue, which goes and comes, leaps, crawls, slobbers, and stirs about in monstrous wise in that immense gray fog composed of rain and night, of hunger, of vice, of falsehood of injustice, of nudity, of suffocation, and of winter, the high noonday of the miserable. Let us have compassion on the chastised. Alas, who are we ourselves? Who am I who now address you? Who are you who are now listening to me? And are you very sure that we have done nothing before we were born? The earth is not devoid of resemblance to a jail. Who knows whether man is not a recaptured offender against divine justice? Look closely at life. It is so made that everywhere we feel the sense of punishment. Are you what is called a happy man? Well, you are sad every day. Each day has its own great grief or its little care. Yesterday you were trembling for a health that is dear to you. Today you fear for your own. Tomorrow it will be anxiety about money. The day after, tomorrow the diatribe of a slanderer. The day after that, the misfortune of some friend. Then the prevailing weather. Then something that has been broken or lost. Then a pleasure with which your conscience and your vertebral column reproach you. Again, the course of public affairs, this without reckoning in the pains of the heart, and so it goes on. One cloud is dispelled, another forms. There is hardly one day out of a hundred which is wholly joyous and sunny, and you belong to that small class who are happy. As for the rest of mankind, stagnating night, rests upon them. Thoughtful minds make but little use of the phrase the fortunate and the unfortunate. In this world, evidently the vestibule of another, there are no fortunate. The real human division is this, the luminous and the shady. To diminish the number of the shady, to augment the number of the luminous, that is the object. That is why we cry education, science. To teach reading means to light the fire. Every syllable spelled out sparkles. However, he who says light does not necessarily say joy. People suffer in the light. Excess burns. The flame is the enemy of the wing, to burn without ceasing to fly. Therein lies the marvel of genius. When you shall have learned to know and to love, you will still suffer. 
The day is born in tears. The luminous weep, if only over those in darkness. End of Book 7, Chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Book 7 of Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book 7, Slang, Chapter 2 Chapter 2, Roots Slang is the tongue of those who sit in darkness. Thought is moved in its most sombre depths. Social philosophy is bidden to its most poignant meditations in the presence of that enigmatic dialect at once so blighted and rebellious. Therein lies chastisement made visible. Every syllable has an air of being marked. The words of the vulgar tongue appear therein wrinkled and shriveled, as it were, beneath the hot iron of the executioner. Some seem to be still smoking. Such and such a phrase produces upon you the effect of a shoulder of a thief branded with the fleur de lis, which has suddenly been laid bare. Ideas almost refuse to be expressed in these substantives, which are fugitives from justice. Metaphor is sometimes so shameless that one feels that it has worn the iron neck fetter. Moreover, in spite of all this, and because of all this, this strange dialect has by rights its own compartment in that great impartial case of pigeonholes where there is room for the rusty farthing as well as for the gold metal, and which is called literature. Slang, whether the public admit the fact or not, has its syntax and its poetry. It is a language. Yes, by the deformity of certain terms, we recognize the fact that it was chewed by Mandrin, and by the splendor of certain metonymies, we feel that Villon spoke it. That exquisite and celebrated verse, Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? But where are the snows of years gone by? is a verse of slang. Antam, ante anum, is a word of tune slang, which signified the past year, and by extension, formally. Thirty five years ago, at the epoch of the departure of the great chain gang, there could be read in one of the cells at Bicetra. This maxim engraved with a nail on the wall by a king of Thun condemned to the galleys. Le daube dont ton trimé siempre pour la pierre de serre. This means kings in days gone by always went and had themselves anointed. In the opinion of that king, anointment meant the galleys. The word décarade, which expresses the departure of heavy vehicles at a gallop, is attributed to Villon, and it is worthy of him. This word, which strikes fire with all four of its feet, sums up in a masterly onomatopoeia the whole of La Fontaine's admirable verse, Si four chevaux tirent un coche, six stout horses drew a coach. From a purely literary point of view, few studies would prove more curious and fruitful than the study of slang. It is a whole language within a language, a sort of sickly excrescence, an unhealthy graft which has produced a vegetation, a parasite which has its roots in the old Gallic trunk, and whose sinister foliage crawls all over one side of the language. This is what may be called the first, the vulgar aspect of slang. But for those who study the tongue as it should be studied, that is to say, as geologists study the earth, slang appears like a veritable alluvial deposit. According as one digs a longer or shorter distance into it, one finds in slang, below the old popular French, Provençal, Spanish, Italian, Levantine, that language of the Mediterranean ports, English and German, the Romance language in its three varieties, French, Italian and Romance, Romance, Latin, and finally Basque and Celtic, a profound and unique formation a subterranean edifice erected in common by all the miserable. Each accursed race has deposited its lair, each suffering has dropped its stone there, each heart has contributed its pebble. A throng of evil, base or irritated souls, who have traversed life and have vanished into eternity, linger there almost entirely visible, still beneath the form of some monstrous word.
Do you want Spanish? The old Gothic slang abounded in it. Here is Boffet, a box on the ear, which is derived from Boffeton. Vantin, window. Later on, Vantin, which comes from Vantana. Gat, cat, which comes from Gato. Asit, oil, which comes from Asit. Do you want Italian? Here is spade, sword, which comes from spada. Carvel, boat, which comes from caravella. Do you want English? Here is bishop, which comes from bishop. Raya, spy, which comes from rascal. Rascalion, pilch, a case, which comes from pilcher, a sheath. Do you want German? Here is the couleur, the waiter, kellner. The hills, the master, Herzog, duke. Do you want Latin? Here is frangir, to break, frangere, a fure, to steal, fur, caden, chain, catena. There is one word which crops up in every language of the continent, with a sort of mysterious power and authority. It is the word manus. The Scotchman makes of it his mac which designates the chief of the clan, Macfarlane, Macallamore, the great Farlane, the great Cullamore. Slang turns it into Mech, and later Le Mech, that is to say, God. Would you like Basque? Here is Cahisto, the devil, which comes from Gaitstor, evil. Sor Gabon, good night, which comes from Gabon, good evening. Do you want Celtic? Here is Blavin, a handkerchief, which comes from Blavé, gushing water. Menes, a woman, in a bad sense, which comes from Mainec, full of stones. Baran, brook, which comes from Baranton, fountain. Goffeur, locksmith, from Goff, blacksmith. Gudeuse, death, which comes from Gendu, black, white. Finally, would you like history? Slang calls crowns Le Maltes, a souvenir of the coin in circulation on the galleys of Malta. In addition to the philological origins just indicated, slang possesses other and still more natural roots, which spring, so to speak, from the mind of man itself. In the first place, the direct creation of words. Therein lies the mystery of tongues. To paint with words which contains figures one knows not how or why, is a primitive foundation of all human languages, what may be called their granite. Slang abounds in words of this description, immediate words, words created instantaneously, no one knows either where or by whom, without etymology, without analogies, without derivatives, solitary, barbarous, sometimes hideous words, which at times possess a singular power of expression, and which live. The executioner, le toll, the forest, le sabri, fear, flight, tough, the lackey, le larbin, the mineral, the prefect, the minister, pharos, the devil, le rabouin. Nothing is stranger than these words which both mask and reveal. Some, le rabouin, for example, are at the same time grotesque and terrible, and produce on you the effect of a cyclopean grimace. In the second place, metaphor. The peculiarity of a language which is desirous of saying all, yet concealing all, is that it is rich in figures. Metaphor is an enigma wherein the thief who is plotting a stroke, the prisoner who is arranging an escape, take refuge. No idiom is more metaphorical than slang. Diviser le coco. To unscrew the nut. To twist the neck. Tortiller. To wriggle. To eat. Etrogerbe to be tried, a rat, a bread thief, il en skin, it rains, a striking ancient figure which partly bears its date about it, which assimilates long oblique lines of rain, with the dense and slanting pikes of the lancers, and which compresses into a single word the popular expression, it rains halberds. Sometimes, in proportion as slang progresses from the first epoch to the second, Words pass from the primitive and savage sense to the metaphorical sense. The devil ceases to be le rabouin and becomes le boulanger, the baker, 
who puts the bread into the oven. This is more witty, but less grand, something like Racine after Corneille, like Euripides after Aeschylus. Certain slang phrases which participate in the two epochs and have at once the barbaric character and the metaphorical character resemble phantasmagories. The chaugeries vont solliciter des gars à la lune. The prowlers are going to steal horses by night. This passes before the mind like a group of spectres. One knows not what one sees. In the third place, the expedient. Slang lives on the language. It uses it in accordance with its fancy. It dips into it haphazard, and it often confines itself, when occasion arises, to alter it in a gross and summary fashion. Occasionally, with the ordinary words thus deformed and complicated with words of pure slang, picturesque phrases are formed, in which there can be felt the mixture of the two preceding elements, the direct creation and the metaphor. Le cab jaspine, je marron, que la roulotte de panton crime dans le sabri. The dog is barking. I suspect that the diligence for Paris is passing through the woods. Le dab est cendre. Le dabouge et le merossière. Le fait est votif. The bourgeois is stupid. The bourgeoisie is cunning. The daughter is pretty. Generally, to throw listeners off the track, slang confines itself to adding to all the words of the language without distinction an ignoble tale, a termination in ayr, or yerg, or in ush. Thus, vos yerg travaille bon org si Do you think that leg of mutton good? a phrase addressed by Cartouche to a turnkey in order to find out whether the sum offered for his escape suited him. The termination in Mar has been added recently. Slang, being the dialect of corruption, quickly becomes corrupted itself. Besides this, as it is always seeking concealment, as soon as it feels that it is understood, it changes its form. Contrary to what happens with every other vegetation, Every ray of light which falls upon it kills whatever it touches. Thus slang is in constant process of decomposition and recomposition, an obscure and rapid work which never pauses. It passes over more ground in ten years than the language in ten centuries. Thus le laton, bread, becomes le latif. Le gaire, horse, becomes le guerre. La fertonche, straw, becomes la fertie, le momignard, brat, le momarque, le fic, duds, frusque, le chic, le church, le crujois, le calabre, nec, le cola. The devil is at first cahisto, then le rabouin, then the baker, the priest is a ratichon, then the boar, le sanglier. The dagger is le vin du, twenty-two, then le serin, then le langre. The police are raille, then roussin, then rousset, then marchand de la sée, dealers in stay laces, then coqueur, then cogne. The executioner is le tol, then charlot, la tigeur, then le bacillard. In the seventeenth century, to fight, was to give each other snuff. In the nineteenth, it is to chew each other's throats. There have been twenty different phrases between these two extremes. Cartouche's talk would have been Hebrew to la Sonnerre. All the words of this language are perpetually engaged in flight, like the men who utter them. Still, from time to time, and in consequence of this very movement, the ancient slang crops up again and becomes new once more. It has its headquarters where it maintains its sway. The temple preserved the slang of the 17th century. Bichetre, when it was a prison, preserved the slang of Thun. There one could hear the termination in Anche of the old Thuneurs. Boinche tu, vois tu, do you drink? But perpetual movement remains its law, nevertheless. If the philosopher succeeds in fixing, for a moment, for purposes of observation, this language which is incessantly evaporating, he falls into doleful and useful meditation. No study is more efficacious and more fecund in instruction. There is not a metaphor, 
not an analogy in slang which does not contain a lesson. Among these men, to beat means to feign. One beats a malady. Ruse is their strength. For them, the idea of the man is not separated from the idea of darkness. The night is called la sorgue, man, l'orgue. Man is the derivative of the night. They have taken up the practice of considering society in the light of an atmosphere which kills them, of a fatal force, and they speak of their liberty as one would speak of his health. A man under arrest is a sick man. A man who is condemned is a dead man. The most terrible thing for the prisoner within the four walls in which he is buried is a sort of glacial chastity, and he calls the dungeon the castus. In that funereal place, life outside always presents itself under its most smiling aspect. The prisoner has irons on his feet. You think, perhaps, that his thought is that it is with the feet that one walks. No, he is thinking that it is with the feet that one dances. So, when he has succeeded in severing his fetters, his first idea is that now he can dance. And he calls the saw, the bastrang, public house ball. A name is a centre, profound assimilation. The ruffian has two heads, one of which reasons out his actions and leads him all his life long, and the other which he has upon his shoulders on the day of his death. He calls the head which counsels him in crime, la sorbonne, and the head which expiates it, la tranche. When a man has no longer anything but rags upon his body and vices in his heart, when he has arrived at that double moral and material degradation which the word blackguard characterizes in its two acceptations, he is ripe for crime. He is like a well-whetted knife. He has two cutting edges, his distress and his malice. So slang does not say a blackguard. It says un rigiz. What are the galleys? A brazier of damnation, a hell. The convict calls himself a fagot. And finally, what the name do malefactors give to their prison? The college. A whole penitentiary system can be evolved from that word. Does the reader wish to know where the majority of the songs of the galleys, those refrains called in a special vocabulary l'ironfa, have had their birth? Let him listen to what follows. There existed at the Châtelet in Paris a large and long cellar. This cellar was eight feet below the level of the Seine. It had neither windows nor air holes. Its only aperture was the door. Men could enter there, air could not. This vault had for ceiling a vault of stone and for floor ten inches of mud. It was flagged, but the pavement had rotted and cracked under the oozing of the water. Eight feet above the floor, a long and massive beam traversed this subterranean excavation from side to side. From this beam hung, at short distances apart, chains three feet long, and at the end of these chains there were rings for the neck. In this vault, men who had been condemned to the galleys were incarcerated until the day of their departure for Toulon. They were thrust under this beam, where each one found his fetters swinging in the darkness and waiting for him. The chains those pendant arms, and the necklets, those open hands, caught the unhappy wretches by the throat. They were riveted and left there. As the chain was too short, they could not lie down. They remained motionless in that cavern, in that night, beneath that beam, almost hanging, forced to unheard-of efforts to reach their bread, jug, or their vault overhead, mud even to mid-leg, filth flowing to their very calves, broken asunder with fatigue, with thighs and knees giving way, clinging fast to the chain with their hands in order to obtain some rest, unable to sleep except when standing erect, and awakened every moment by the strangling of the collar. Some woke no more. In order to eat, they pushed the bread, which was flung to them in the mud, along their leg with their heel until it reached their hand. How long did they remain thus? One month? two months, six months sometimes. One stayed a year. It was the antechamber of the galleys. Men were put there for stealing a hair from the king. In this sepulchre hell, what did they do? What man can do in a sepulchre? They went through the agonies of death. 
And what can man do in hell, they sang. For song lingers where there is no longer any hope. In the waters of Malta, when a galley was approaching, the song could be heard before the sound of the oars. Poor Sur Vincent, the poacher, who had gone through the prison cellar of the Châtelet, said, It was the rhymes that kept me up. Uselessness of poetry. What is the good of rhyme? It is in this cellar that nearly all the slang songs had their birth. It is from the dungeon of the Grand Châtelet of Paris that comes a melancholy refrain of the Montgomery Galley. Timalumisan, Timalumison. The majority of these, ici caille et la théâtre du petit dardon. Here is the theatre of the little archer, Cupid. Do what you will, you cannot annihilate that eternal relic in the heart of man, love. In this world of dismal deeds, people keep their secrets. The secret is the thing above all others. The secret, in the eyes of these wretches, is unity, which serves as a base of union. To betray a secret is to tear from each member of this fierce community something of his own personality. To inform against, in the energetic slang dialect, is called to eat the bit, as though each informer drew to himself a little of the substance of all and nourished himself on a bit of each one's flesh. What does it signify to receive a box on the ear? Commonplace metaphor replies, It is to see thirty-six candles. Here slang intervenes and takes it up. Candle, camoufle. Thereupon the ordinary tongue gives camoufle as the synonym for souffle. Thus, by a sort of infiltration from below upwards, with the aid of metaphor, that incalculable trajectory slang mounts from the cavern to the academy, and Poulet, saying, I like my camoufle, causes Voltaire to write, L'Anglivier La Bomille deserves a hundred camouflets. Researches in slang mean discoveries at every step. Study and investigation of this strange idiom lead to the mysterious point of intersection of regular society with society which is accursed. The thief also has his food for cannon stealable matter, you, I, whoever passes by, le peintre, pan, everybody. Slang is language turned convict. That the thinking principle of man be thrust down ever so low, that it can be dragged and pinioned there by obscure tyrannies of fatality, that it can be bound by no one knows what fetters in that abyss, is sufficient to cause consternation. Oh, poor thought of miserable wretches! Alas, will no one come to the succour of the human soul in that darkness? Is it her destiny there to await for ever the mind, the liberator, the immense rider of pegasi and hippogriffs, the combatant of heroes of the dawn who shall descend from the Asia between two wings, the radiant night of the future? Will she for ever summon in vain to her assistance the lance of light of the ideal? Is she condemned to hear the fearful approach of evil through the density of the gulf, and to catch glimpses, nearer and nearer at hand, beneath the hideous water of that dragon's head, that moor streaked with foam, and that writhing undulation of claws, swellings, and rings? Must it remain there, without a gleam of light, without hope, given over to that terrible approach, vaguely scented out by the monster, shuddering, dishevelled, wringing its arms, forever chained to the rock of night, a sombre Andromeda, white and naked amid the shadows. End of Book 7, Chapter 2 Chapters 3 and 4 of Book 7 of Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book 7 Slang Chapters 3 and 4 Chapter 3 Slang which weeps and slang which laughs As the reader perceives, slang in its entirety, slang of 400 years ago, like the slang of today, is permeated with that sombre, symbolical spirit which gives to all words a mean which is now mournful, now menacing. One feels in it the wild and ancient sadness of those vagrants of the court of miracles, 
who played at cards with packs of their own, some of which have come down to us. The eight of clubs, for instance, represented a huge tree bearing eight enormous trefoil leaves, a sort of fantastic personification of the forest. At the foot of this tree a fire was burning, over which three hares were roasting a huntsman on a spit, and behind him, on another fire, hung a steaming pot, whence emerged the head of a dog. Nothing can be more melancholy than these reprisals in painting, by a pack of cards, in the presence of stakes for the roasting of smugglers, and of the cauldron for the boiling of counterfeiters. The diverse forms assumed by thought in the realm of slang, even song, even raillery, even menace, all partook of this powerless and dejected character. All the songs, the melodies of some of which have been collected, were humble and lamentable to the point of evoking tears. The pegler is always the poor pegler, and he is always the hare in hiding, the fugitive mouse, the flying bird. He hardly complains, he contents himself with sighing. One of his moans has come down to us. I do not understand how God, the father of men, can torture his children and his grandchildren and hear them cry without himself suffering torture. The wretch, whenever he has time to think, makes himself small before the low and frail in the presence of society. He lies down flat on his face. He entreats. He appeals to the side of compassion. We feel that he is conscious of his guilt. Towards the middle of the last century, a change took place. Prison songs and thieves' ritonelles assumed, so to speak, an insolent and jovial mien. The plaint of Melur was replaced by the La Rifla. We find, in the eighteenth century, in nearly all the songs of the galleys and prisons, a diabolical and enigmatical gaiety. We hear this strident and lilting refrain, which we should say had been lighted up by a phosphorescent gleam, and which seems to have been flung into the forest by a will-o'-the-wisp playing the fife. Mira la bille sous la babo, mire les tons, ribon ribet, sous la babi, mire la babo, mire les tons, ribon ribot. This was sung in a cellar, or in a nook of the forest, while cutting a man's throat. A serious symptom. In the eighteenth century, the ancient melancholy of the dejected classes vanishes. They began to laugh. They rally the grand Meg and the grand Dob. Given Louis the fifteenth, they call the King of France the Marquis de Panton, and behold, they are almost gay. A sort of gleam proceeds from these miserable wretches, as though their consciences were not heavy within them any more. These lamentable tribes of darkness have no longer merely the desperate audacity of actions, they possess the heedless audacity of mind. A sign that they are losing the sense of their criminality, and that they feel, even among thinkers and dreamers, some indefinable support which the latter themselves know not of. A sign that theft and pillage are beginning to filter into doctrines and sophisms, in such a way as to lose somewhat of their ugliness, while communicating much of it to sophisms and doctrines. A sign, in short, of some outbreak which is prodigious and near, unless some diversion shall arise. Let us pause a moment. Whom are we accusing here? Is it the eighteenth century? Is it philosophy? Certainly not. The work of the eighteenth century is healthy and good and wholesome. The encyclopedists, Diderot at their head, the physiocrats, Turgot at their head, the philosophers, Voltaire at their head, the utopians, Rousseau at their head. These are four sacred legions. Humanity's immense advance towards the light is due to them. They are the four vanguards of the human race, marching towards the four cardinal points of progress. Diderot towards the beautiful, Turgot towards the useful, Voltaire towards the true, Rousseau towards the just. But by the side of and above the philosophers, there were the sophists, a venomous vegetation mingled with a healthy growth, hemlock in the virgin forest. While the executioner was burning the great books of the liberators of the century on the grand staircase of the courthouse, writers now forgotten were publishing, with the king's sanction, no one knows what strangely disorganizing writings, which were eagerly read by the unfortunate. Some of these publications, odd to say, which were patronized by a prince, 
are to be found in the secret library. These facts, significant but unknown, were imperceptible on the surface. Sometimes, in the very obscurity of a fact lurks its danger. It is obscure because it is underhand. Of all these writers, the one who probably then excavated in the masses the most unhealthy gallery was Restif à la Breton. This work, peculiar to the whole of Europe, affected more ravages in Germany than anywhere else. In Germany, during a given period, summed up by Schiller in his famous drama The Robbers, theft and pillage rose up in protest against property and labour, assimilated certain specious and false elementary ideas, which, though just in appearance, were absurd in reality, enveloped themselves in these ideas, disappeared within them, after a fashion, assumed an abstract name, passed into the state of theory, and in that shape circulated among the laborious, suffering, and honest masses, unknown even to the imprudent chemists who had prepared the mixture, unknown even to the masses who accepted it. Whenever a fact of this sort presents itself, the case is grave. Suffering engenders wrath, and while the prosperous classes blind themselves or fall asleep, which is the same thing as shutting one's eyes, the hatred of the unfortunate classes lights its torch at some aggrieved or ill-made spirit which dreams in a corner and sets itself to the scrutiny of society. The scrutiny of hatred is a terrible thing. Hence, if the ill fortune of the times so wills it, those fearful commotions, which were formerly called jacqueries, beside which purely political agitations are the merest child's play, which are no longer the conflict of the oppressed and the oppressor, but the revolt of discomfort against comfort, then everything crumbles. Jacqueries are the earthquakes of the people. It is this peril, possibly imminent towards the close of the 18th century, which the French Revolution, that immense act of probity, cut short. The French Revolution, which is nothing else than the idea armed with the sword, rose erect, and with the same abrupt movement, closed the door of ill, and opened the door of good. It put a stop to torture, promulgated the truth, expelled miasma, rendered the century healthy, crowned the populace. It may be said of it that it created man a second time, by giving him a second soul, the right. The nineteenth century has inherited and profited by its work, and today the social catastrophe to which we lately alluded is simply impossible. Blind is he who announces it. Foolish is he who fears it. Revolution is the vaccine of Jacquerie. Thanks to the revolution, social conditions have changed. Feudal and monarchical maladies no longer run in our blood. There is no more of the Middle Ages in our constitution. We no longer live in the days when terrible swarms within made eruptions, when one heard beneath his feet the obscure course of a dull rumble, when indescribable elevations from mole-like tunnels appeared on the surface of civilization, where the soil cracked open, where the roofs of caverns yawned, and where one suddenly beheld monstrous heads emerging from the earth. The revolutionary sense is a moral sense. The sentiment of right, once developed, develops the sentiment of duty. The law of all is liberty, which ends where the liberty of others begins, according to Robespierre's admirable definition. Since 89, the whole people has been dilating into a sublime individual. There is not a poor man who, possessing his right, has not his ray of sun, the die of hunger feels within him the honesty of France. The dignity of the citizen is an internal armour. He who is free is scrupulous. He who votes reigns. Hence incorruptibility. Hence the miscarriage of unhealthy lusts. Hence eyes heroically lowered before temptations. The revolutionary wholesomeness is such that on a day of deliverance, a 14th of July, a 10th of August, there is no longer any populace. The first cry of the enlightened and increasing throngs is, Death to thieves! Progress is an honest man. The ideal and the absolute do not filch pocket handkerchiefs. By whom were the wagons containing the wealth of the Tuileries escorted in 1848? By the rag pickers of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. Rags mounted guard over the treasure. 
Virtue rendered these tatterdemalions resplendent. In those wagons in chests, hardly closed, and some even half open, amid a hundred dazzling caskets, was that ancient crown of France, studded with diamonds, surmounted by the carbuncle of royalty, by the regent diamond, which was worth thirty millions. Barefooted, they guarded that crown. Hence, no more jacquerie. I regret it for the sake of the skilful. The old fear has produced its last effects in that quarter, and henceforth it can no longer be employed in politics. The principal spring of the red spectre is broken. Everyone knows it now. The scarecrow scares no longer. The birds take liberty with the mannequin. Foul creatures alight upon it. The bourgeois laugh at it. Chapter 4 The Two Duties To Watch and To Hope this being the case, is all social danger dispelled? Certainly not. There is no jacquerie. Society may rest assured on that point. Blood will no longer rush to its head. But let society take heed to the manner in which it breathes. Apoplexy is no longer to be feared, but thysis is there. Social thysis is called misery. One can perish from being undermined, as well as from being struck by lightning. Let us not weary of repeating, and sympathetic souls must not forget that this is the first of fraternal obligations, and selfish hearts must understand that the first of political necessities consists in thinking first of all of the disinherited and sorrowing throngs, in solacing, airing, enlightening, loving them, and enlarging their horizon to a magnificent extent, in lavishing upon them education in every form in offering them the example of labour, never the example of idleness, in diminishing the individual burden by enlarging the notion of the universal aim, in setting a limit to poverty without setting a limit to wealth, in creating vast fields of public and popular activity, in having, like Prieris, a hundred hands to extend in all directions to the oppressed and the feeble, in employing the collective power for that grand duty of opening workshops for all arms, schools for all aptitudes, and laboratories for all degrees of intelligence, in augmenting salaries, diminishing trouble, balancing what should be and what is, that is to say, in proportioning enjoyment to effort and a glut to need, in a word, in evolving from the social apparatus more light and more comfort for the benefit of those who suffer and to those who are ignorant. And, let us say it, all this is but the beginning, the true question is this. Labour cannot be a law without being a right. We will not insist on this point. This is not the proper place for that. If nature calls itself providence, society should call itself foresight. Intellectual and moral growth is no less indispensable than material improvement. To know is a sacrament. To think is the prime necessity. Truth is nourishment as well as grain. A reason which fasts from science and wisdom grows thin. Let us enter equal complaint against stomachs and minds which do not eat. If there is anything more heartbreaking than a body perishing for lack of bread, it is the soul which is dying from hunger for the light. The whole progress tends in the direction of solution. Some day we shall be amazed. As the human race mounts upward, the deep layers emerge naturally from the zone of distress. The obliteration of misery will be accomplished by a simple elevation of level. We should do wrong were we to doubt this blessed consummation. The past is very strong, it is true, at the present moment. It censures. This rejuvenation of a corpse is surprising. Behold, it is walking and advancing. It seems a victor. This dead body is a conqueror. He arrives with his legions, superstitions, with his sword, despotism with his banner, ignorance. A while ago he won ten battles. He advances, he threatens, he laughs, he is at our doors. Let us not despair on our side. Let us sell the field on which Hannibal is encamped. What have we to fear, we who believe? No such thing as a backflow of ideas exists any more than there exists a return of a river on its course. But let those who do not desire a future reflect on this matter. When they say no to progress, 
It is not the future, but themselves, that they are condemning. They are giving themselves a sad malady. They are inoculating themselves with the past. There is but one way of rejecting tomorrow, and that is to die. Now, no death, that of the body as late as possible, that of the soul, never. This is what we desire. Yes, the enigma will utter its word, the sphinx will speak, the problem will be solved. Yes, the people, sketched out by the 18th century, will be finished by the 19th. He who doubts this is an idiot. The future blossoming, the near blossoming forth, of universal well-being is a divinely fatal phenomenon. Immense combined propulsions direct human affairs and conduct them within a given time to a logical state, that is to say, to a state of equilibrium, that is to say, to equity. A force composed of earth and heaven results from humanity and governs it. This force is a worker of miracles. Marvellous issues are no more difficult to it than extraordinary vicissitudes. Aided by science, which comes from one man, and by the event, which comes from another, it is not greatly alarmed by these contradictions in the attitude of problems, which seem impossibilities to the vulgar herd. It is no less skilful at causing a solution to spring forth from the reconciliation of ideas than the lesson from the reconciliation of facts. And we may expect anything from that mysterious power of progress, which brought the Orient and the Occident face to face one fine day in the depth of a sepulchre and made the Imams converse with Bonaparte in the interior of the Great Pyramid. In the meantime, let there be no halt, no hesitation, no pause in the grandiose onward march of minds. Social philosophy consists essentially in science and peace. Its object is, and its results may be, to dissolve wrath by the study of antagonism. It examines, it scrutinizes, it analyzes. Then it puts together once more, it proceeds by means of reduction, discarding all hatred. More than once, a society has been seen to give way before the wind which is let loose upon mankind. History is full of the shipwrecks of nations and empires, manners, customs, laws, religions, and some fine day that unknown force, the hurricane, passes by and bears them all away. The civilizations of India, of Chaldea, of Persia, of Syria, of Egypt have disappeared one after the other. Why? We know not. What are the causes of these disasters? We do not know. Could these societies have been saved? Was it their fault? Did they persist in the fatal vice which destroyed them? What is the amount of suicide in these terrible deaths of a nation and a race? Questions to which there exists no reply. Darkness in wraps condemned civilizations. They sprung a leak, then they sank. We have nothing more to say, and it is with a sort of terror that we look on at the bottom of that sea which is called the past, behind those colossal waves at the shipwreck of those immense vessels, Babylon, Nineveh, Tarsus, Thebes, Rome, beneath the fearful gusts which emerge from all the mouths of the shadows. But shadows are there, and light is here. We are not acquainted with the maladies of these ancient civilizations. We do not know the infirmities of our own. Everywhere upon it we have the right of light. We contemplate its beauties. We lay bare its defects. Where it is ill, we probe. And the sickness, once diagnosed, the study of the cause leads to the discovery of the remedy. Our civilization, the work of twenty centuries, is its law and its prodigy. It is worth the trouble of saving. It will be saved. It is already much to have solaced it. Its enlightenment is yet another point. All the labors of modern social philosophies must converge towards this point. The thinker of today has a great duty to auscultate civilization. We repeat that this auscultation brings encouragement. It is by this persistence in encouragement that we wish to conclude these pages, an austere interlude in a mournful drama. Beneath the social mortality we feel human imperishableness. The globe does not perish because it has these wounds, craters, eruptions, sulphur pits, here and there. 
nor because of a volcano which ejects its pus. The maladies of the people do not kill man. And yet, anyone who follows the course of social clinics shakes his head at times. The strongest, the tenderest, the most logical, have their hours of weakness. Will the future arrive? It seems as though we might almost put this question when we behold so much terrible darkness. Melancholy face-to-face -face encounter of selfish and wretched. On the part of the selfish, the prejudices, shadows of costly education, appetite increasing through intoxication, a giddiness of prosperity which dulls, a fear of suffering which, in some, goes as far as an aversion for the suffering, an implacable satisfaction, the eye so swollen that it bars the soul. On the side of the wretched, covetousness, envy, hatred of seeing others enjoy, the profound impulses of the human beast towards assuaging its desires, hearts full of mist, sadness, need, fatality, impure and simple ignorance. Shall we continue to raise our eyes to heaven? Is the luminous point which we distinguish there one of those which vanish? The ideal is frightful to behold, thus lost in the depths, small, isolated, imperceptible, brilliant, yet surrounded by those great black menaces monstrously heaped around it, yet no more in danger than a star in the moor of the clouds. End of Book 7, Chapters 3 and 4 Chapter 1 of Book 8 of Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 8, Enchantments and Desolations. Chapter 1, Full Light. The reader has probably understood that Eponine, having recognized through the gate the inhabitant of that Rue Plumont where the Mignon had sent her, had begun by keeping the ruffians away from the Rue Plumont, and had then conducted Marius thither, and that, after many days spent in ecstasy before that gate, Marius, drawn on by that force which draws the iron to the magnet, and a lover toward the stones of which is built the house of her whom he loves, had finally entered Cosette's garden, as Romeo entered the garden of Juliet. This had proved easier for him than for Romeo. Romeo was obliged to scale a wall. Marius had only to use a little force on one of the bars of the decrepit gate, which vacillated in its rusty recess, after the fashion of old people's teeth. Marius was slender and readily passed through. As there was never anyone in the street, and as Marius never entered the garden except at night, he ran no risk of being seen. Beginning with that blessed and holy hour when a kiss betrothed these two souls, Marius was there every evening. If at that period of her existence, Cosette had fallen in love with a man in the least unscrupulous or debauched, she would have been lost, for there are generous natures which yield themselves, and Cosette was one of them. One of woman's magnanimities is to yield. Love, at the height where it is absolute, is complicated with some indescribably celestial blindness of modesty. But what dangers you run, O noble souls! How often you give the heart and we take the body! Your heart remains with you. You gaze upon it in the gloom with a shudder. Love has no middle course. It either ruins or it saves. All human destiny lies in this dilemma. This dilemma, ruin or safety, is set forth no more inexorably by any fatality than by love. Love is life if it is not death. Cradle, also coffin. The same sentiment says yes and no in the human heart. Of all the things that God has made, the human heart is the one which sheds the most light, alas, and the most darkness. God willed that Cosette's love should encounter one of the loves which save. Throughout the whole of the month of May of that year 1832, there were there, in every night, in that poor neglected garden, beneath that thicket which grew thicker and more fragrant day by day, two beings composed of all chastity, all innocence, overflowing with all the felicity of heaven, nearer to the archangels than to mankind, pure, honest, intoxicated, radiant, who shone for each other amid the shadows. It seemed to Cosette that Marius had a crown, and to Marius that Cosette had a nimbus. They touched each other, they gazed at each other, they clasped each other's hands, they pressed close to each other, 
but there was a distance which they did not pass. Not that they respected it, they did not know of its existence. Marius was conscious of a barrier, Cosette's innocence, and Cosette of a support, Marius's loyalty. The first kiss had also been the last. Marius, since that time, had not gone further than to touch Cosette's hand, or her kerchief, or a lock of hair with his lips. For him, Cosette was a perfume and not a woman. He inhaled her. She refused nothing, and he asked nothing. Cosette was happy, and Marius was satisfied. They lived in this ecstatic state, which can be described as the dazzling of one soul by another soul. It was the ineffable first embrace of two maiden souls in the ideal, two swans meeting on the Yongfro. At that hour of love, an hour when voluptuousness is absolutely mute, beneath the omnipotence of ecstasy, Marius, the pure and seraphic Marius, would rather have gone to a woman of the town than have raised Cosette's robe to the height of her ankle. Once, in the moonlight, Cosette stooped to pick up something on the ground. Her bodice fell apart and permitted a glimpse of the beginning of her throat. Marius turned away his eyes. What took place between these two beings? Nothing. They adored each other. At night, when they were there, that garden seemed a living and sacred spot. All flowers unfolded around them and sent them incense, and they opened their souls and scattered them over the flowers. The wanton and vigorous vegetation quivered, full of strength and intoxication around these two innocents, and they uttered words of love which set the trees to trembling. What words were these? Breaths, nothing more. These breaths sufficed to trouble and to touch all nature round about. Magic power, which we should find it difficult to understand were we to read in a book these conversations which are made to be borne away and dispersed like smoke wreaths by the breeze beneath the leaves. Take from these murmurs of two lovers that melody which proceeds from the soul and which accompanies them like a lyre, and what remains is nothing more than a shade. You say, what? Is that all? Ah, uh, yes. Childish prattle, repetitions, laughter at nothing, nonsense, everything that is deepest and most sublime in the world, the only things which are worth the trouble of saying and hearing. The man who has never heard, the man who has never uttered these absurdities, these sultry marks, is an imbecile and a malicious fellow. Cosette said to Marius, Dost thou know? In all this and athwart this celestial maidenliness, and without either of them being able to say how it had come about, they had begun to call each other thou. Dost thou know? My name is Euphrasie. Euphrasie? Why no, thy name is Cosette. Oh, Cosette is a very ugly name that was given to me when I was a little thing. But my real name is Euphrasie. Dost thou like that name? Euphrasie. Yes, but Cosette is not ugly. Do you like it better than Euphrasie? Why, yes. Then I like it better too. Truly, it is pretty, Cosette. Call me Cosette. And the smile that she added made of this dialogue an idol worthy of the grove situated in heaven. On another occasion, she gazed intently at him and exclaimed, Monsieur, you are handsome. You are good looking. You are witty. You're not at all stupid. You are much more learned than I am. But I bid you defiance with this world. I love you. And Marius, in the very heavens, thought he heard a strain sung by a star. Or she bestowed on him this gentle tap because he coughed, and she said to him, Don't cough, sir. I will not have people cough in my domain without my permission. It is very naughty to cough and disturb me. I want you to be well because, in the first place, if you are not well, I should be very unhappy. What should I do then? And this was simply divine. Once, Marius said to Cosette, Just imagine, I thought at one time that your name was Ursula. This made the both of them laugh the whole evening. In the middle of another conversation, he chanced to exclaim, Oh, one day, on the Luxembourg, I had a good mind to finish breaking up a veteran. But he stopped short and went no further. He would have been obliged to speak to Gosette of her garter, and that was impossible. This bordered on a strange theme, the flesh, before which that immense and innocent love recoiled with a sort of sacred fright. Marius pictured life with Cosette to himself like this, without anything else. To come every evening to the Rue Plumont, to displace the old and accommodating bar of the Chief Justice's gate, to sit elbow to elbow on that bench, to gaze through the trees at the centillion of the oncoming night, to fit a fold of the knee of his trousers into the ample fall of Cosette's gown, 
to caress her thumbnail, to call her thou, to smell of the same flower, one after the other, forever, indefinitely. During this time, clouds passed above their heads. Every time that the wind blows, it bears with it more of the dreams of men than of the clouds of heaven. This chaste, almost shy love was not devoid of gallantry by any means. To pay compliments to the woman whom a man loves is the first method of bestowing caresses, and he is half audacious who tries it. A compliment is something like a kiss through a veil. Voluptuousness mingles there with its sweet tiny point while it hides itself. The heart draws back before voluptuousness, only to love the more. Marius's blandishments, all saturated with fancy, were, so to speak, of azure hue. The birds, when they fly up yonder, in the direction of the angels, must hear such words. There were mingled with them, nevertheless, life, humanity, all the positiveness of which Marius was capable. It was what is said in the bower, a prelude to what will be said in the chamber, a lyrical effusion, strophe and sonnet intermingled, pleasing hyperboles of cooing, all the refinements of adoration arranged in a bouquet and exhaling celestial perfume, an ineffable twitter of heart to heart. Oh, murmured Marius, how beautiful you are. I dare not look at you. It is all over with me when I contemplate you. You are grace. I know not what is the matter with me. The hem of your gown when the tip of your shoe is from beneath upsets me. And then, what an enchanted gleam when you open your throat even but a little. You talk astonishingly good sense. It seems to me at all times that you are a dream. Speak, I listen. I admire. Oh, Cosette, how strange it is and how charming. I am really beside myself. You are adorable, mademoiselle. I study your feet with the microscope and your soul with the telescope. And Cosette answered, I have been loving a little more all the times that is passing this morning. Questions and replies took care of themselves in this dialogue, which always turned with mutual consent upon love, as the pith figures always turn on their peg. Cosette's whole person was ingenuousness, ingenuity, transparency, whiteness, candor, radiance. It might have been said of Cosette that she was clear. She produced on those who saw her the sensation of April and dawn. There was dew in her eyes. Cosette was a condensation of the auroral light in the form of a woman. It was quite simple that Marius should admire her, since he adored her, but the truth is that this little schoolgirl, fresh from the convent, talked with exquisite penetration and uttered, at times, all sorts of true and delicate sayings. Her prattle was conversation. She never made a mistake about anything, and she saw things justly. The woman feels and speaks with the tender instinct of the heart, which is infallible. No one understands so well as a woman how to say things that are, at once, both sweet and deep. Sweetness and depth, they are the whole of woman. In them lies the whole of heaven. In this full felicity, tears welled up in their eyes every instant. A crushed ladybug, a feather fallen from the nest, a branch of hawthorn broken, aroused their pity, and their ecstasy, sweetly mingled with melancholy, seemed to ask nothing better than to weep. The most sovereign symptom of love is a tenderness that is, at times, almost unbearable. In addition to this, all these contradictions are the lightning play of love, they were fond of laughing. They laughed readily and with a delicious freedom, and so familiarly that they sometimes presented the air of two boys. Still, though unknown to hearts intoxicated with purity, nature is always present and will not be forgotten. She is there with her brutal and sublime object, and however great may be the innocence of souls, one feels in the most modest private interview the adorable and mysterious shade which separates a couple of lovers from a pair of friends. They idolize each other. The permanent and the immutable are persistent. People live. They smile. They laugh. They make little grimaces with the tips of their lips. They interlace their fingers. They call each other thou, and that does not prevent eternity. Two lovers hide themselves in the evening, in the twilight, in the invisible, with the birds, with the roses. They fascinate each other in the darkness with their hearts, which they throw into their eyes. They murmur, they whisper, and in the meantime, immense liberations of the planets fill the infinite universe. End of Book 8, Chapter 1 Chapters 2 and 3 of Book 8 of Les Miserables, Volume 4 
by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 4, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 8, Chapter 2, The Bewilderment of Perfect Happiness. They existed vaguely, frightened at their happiness. They did not notice the cholera which decimated Paris precisely during that very month. They had confided in each other as far as possible, but this had not extended much further than their names. Marius had told Cosette that he was an orphan, that his name was Marius Pontmercy, that he was a lawyer, that he lived by writing things for publishers, that his father had been a colonel, that the latter had been a hero, and that he, Marius, was on bad terms with his grandfather who was rich. He had also hinted at being a baron, but this had produced no effect on Cosette. She did not know the meaning of the word. Marius was Marius. On her side, she had confided to him that she had been brought up at the Petit Picpus convent, that her mother, like his own, was dead, that her father's name was Monsieur Fauchelevent, that he was very good, that he gave a great deal to the poor, but that he was poor himself and that he denied himself everything, though he denied her nothing. Strange to say, in the sort of symphony which Marius had lived since he had been in the habit of seeing Cosette, the past, even the most recent past, had become so confused and distant to him, that what Cosette had told him satisfied him completely. It did not even occur to him to tell her about the nocturnal adventure in the hovel, about Thenardier, about the burn, and about the strange attitude and singular flight of her father. Marius had momentarily forgotten all this. In the evening, he did not even know that there had been a morning. What he had done, where he had breakfasted, nor who had spoken to him. He had songs in his ears, which rendered him deaf to every other thought. He only existed at the hours when he saw Cosette. Then, as he was in heaven, it was quite natural that he should forget earth. Both bore languidly the indefinable burden of immaterial pleasures. Thus lived these somnambulists who were called lovers. Alas, who is there who has not felt all these things? Why does there come an hour when one emerges from this azure? And why does life go on afterwards? Love almost takes the place of thinking. Love is an ardent forgetfulness of all the rest. Then ask logic of passion if you will. There is no more absolute logical sequence in the human heart than there is a perfect geometrical figure in the celestial mechanism. For Cosette and Marius nothing existed except Marius and Cosette. The universe around them had fallen into a hole. They lived in a golden minute. There was nothing before them, nothing behind. It hardly occurred to Marius that Cosette had a father. His brain was dazzled and obliterated. Of what did these lovers talk then? We have seen of the flowers and the swallows, the setting sun and the rising moon, and all sorts of important things. They had told each other everything except everything. The everything of lovers is nothing. But the father, the realities, that layer, the ruffians, that adventure, to what purpose? And was he very sure that this nightmare had actually existed? They were two, and they adored each other. And beyond that, there was nothing. Nothing else existed. It is probable that this vanishing of hell in our rear is inherent to the arrival of paradise. Have we beheld demons? Are there any? Have we trembled? Have we suffered? We no longer know. A rosy cloud hangs over it. So these two beings lived in this manner, high aloft, with all that improbability which is in nature. Neither at the nadir nor at the zenith, between man and seraphim, above the mire, below the ether, in the clouds, hardly flesh and blood, soul and ecstasy from head to foot. Already too sublime to walk the earth, 
still too heavily charged with humanity to disappear in the blue, suspended like atoms which are waiting to be precipitated, apparently beyond the bounds of destiny, ignorant of that rut, yesterday, today, tomorrow, amazed, rapturous, floating, soaring, at times so light that they could take their flight out into the infinite, almost prepared to soar away to all eternity. They slept wide awake, thus sweetly lulled, oh, splendid lethargy, of the real overwhelmed by the ideal. Sometimes, beautiful as Cosette was, Marius shut his eyes in her presence. The best way to look at the soul is through closed eyes. Marius and Cosette never asked themselves whither this was to lead them. They considered that they had already arrived. It is a strange claim on man's part to wish that love should lead to something. End of chapter 2 Book 8, chapter 3, The Beginning of Shadow Jean Valjean suspected nothing. Cosette, who was rather less dreamy than Marius, was gay, and that sufficed for Jean Valjean's happiness. The thoughts which Cosette cherished, her tender preoccupations, Marius's image which filled her heart, took away nothing from the incomparable purity of her beautiful, chaste, and smiling brow. She was at the age when the Virgin bears her love as the angel his lily. So Jean Valjean was at ease. And then, when two lovers have come to an understanding, things always go well. The third party who might disturb their love is kept in a state of perfect blindness by a restricted number of precautions which are always the same in the case of all others. Thus, Cosette never objected to any of Jean Valjean's proposals. Did she want to take a walk? Yes, dear little father. Did she want to stay at home? Very good. Did he wish to pass the evening with Cosette? She was delighted. As he always went to bed at ten o'clock, Marius did not come to the garden on such occasions until after that hour, when from the street, he heard Cosette open the long glass door on the veranda. Of course, no one ever met Marius in the daytime. Jean Valjean never even dreamed any longer that Marius was in existence. Only once, one morning, he chanced to say to Cosette, Why, you have whitewash on your back. On the previous evening, Marius, in a transport, had pushed Cosette against the wall. Old Toussaint, who retired early, thought of nothing but her sleep, and was as ignorant as the whole matter as Jean Valjean. Marius never set foot in the house. When he was with Cosette, they hid themselves in a recess near the steps, in order that they might neither be seen nor heard from the street, and there they sat, frequently contenting themselves, by way of conversation, with pressing each other's hands twenty times a minute as they gazed at the branches of the trees. At such times, a thunderbolt might have fallen thirty paces from them, and they would not have noticed it. So deeply was the reverie of one absorbed and sunk in the reverie of the other. Limpid purity, ours wholly white, almost all alike. This sort of love is a recollection of lily petals, and the plunge of the dove. The whole extent of the garden lay between them and the street. Every time that Marius entered and left, he carefully adjusted the bar of the gate in such a manner that no displacement was visible. He usually went away about midnight and returned to Corfirac's lodgings. Corfirac said to Bohorel, Would you believe it? Marius comes home nowadays at one o'clock in the morning. Bohoro replied, What do you expect? There's always a petard in a seminary fellow. At times, Corfirac folded his arms, assumed a serious air, and said to Marius, You are getting irregular in your habits, young man. Corfirac, being a practical man, did not take in good part this reflection of an invisible paradise upon Marius. He was not much in the light of concealed passions. It made him impatient, and now and then he called upon Marius to come back to reality. One morning, he threw him this admonition. 
My dear fellow, you produce upon me the effect of being located in the moon. The realm of dreams, the province of illusions, capital, soap bubble. Come, be a good boy. What's her name? But nothing could induce Marius to talk. They might have torn out his nails before one of the two sacred syllables of which that ineffable name, Cosette, was composed. True love is as luminous as the dawn and as silent as the tomb. Only Corfirac saw this change in Marius, that his taciturnity was of the beaming order. During this sweet month of May, Marius and Cosette learned to know these immense delights to dispute and to say you for thou, simply that they might say thou the better afterwards, to talk at great length with very minute details of persons in whom they took not the slightest interest in the world. Another proof that in that ravishing opera called Love, the libretto counts for almost nothing. For Marius to listen to Cosette discussing finery, for Cosette to listen to Marius talk in politics, to listen knee pressed to knee, to the carriages rolling along the Rue de Babylone, to gaze upon the same planet in space, or at the same glowworm gleaming in the grass, to hold their peace together, a still greater delight than conversation, etc., etc. In the meantime, divers complications were approaching. One evening, Marius was on his way to the rendezvous, by way of the boulevard des Invalides. He habitually walked with drooping head. As he was on the point of turning the corner of the Rue Plummet, he heard someone quite close to him say, Good evening, Monsieur Marius. He raised his head and recognized Eponine. This produced a singular effect upon him. He had not thought of that girl a single time since the day when she had conducted him to the Rue Plummet. He had not seen her again, and she had gone completely out of his mind. He had no reasons for anything but gratitude towards her. He owed her his happiness, and yet it was embarrassing to him to meet her. It is an error to think that passion, when it is pure and happy, leads man to a state of perfection. It simply leads him, as we have noted, to a state of oblivion. In this situation, man forgets to be bad, but he also forgets to be good. Gratitude, duty, matters essential and important to be remembered, vanish. At any other time, Marius would have behaved quite differently to Eponine. Absorbed in Cosette, he had not even clearly put it to himself that this Eponine was named Eponine Thenardier, and that she bore the name inscribed in his father's will, that name for which, but a few months before, he would have so ardently sacrificed himself. We show Marius as he was. His father himself was fading out of his soul, to some extent, under the splendor of his love. He replied with some embarrassment, Ah, so it's you, Eponine? Why do you call me you? Have I done anything to you? No, he answered. Certainly he had nothing against her, far from it. Only he felt that he could not do otherwise, now that he used thou for Cosette, than say you to Eponine. As he remained silent, she exclaimed, Say! Then she paused. It seemed as though words failed that creature formerly so heedless and so bold. She tried to smile and could not. Then she resumed. Well? Then she paused again and remained with downcast eyes. Good evening, Mr. Marius, said she suddenly and abruptly, and away she went. End of Book 8, Chapters 2 and 3